recording. So welcome to Math 4.8. I wanted to just finish a little bit of the hexagon hacking is the best in the plane, which we were talking about last time. And so we had this formula, 1 half A plus 1 half B plus 1 half C equals pi halves in a situation where there's really no text that's going on. And you're trying to understand what is happening. And so if we just quickly shift to here, if I take we draw a triangle, here's a triangle. And so we want to ask what's going on. And so we can draw, you know, our circles and, you know, ho hopefully you know, th there's our circle of radius one centered at that point. And we want to ask what part of this circle is inside this region? So how would you calculate that area if it's a circle of radius one? And the angle here is A. What would be the shaded area? I mean, I think so. You know that the area of the circle is pi r squared. So yes. Pi. Yep. And then the sum of the angles of the circle is pi. Well, I'm just saying, what's the area of the shaded amount? So it would be A over A over so it would be a over two. So it's pi r squared is the area of the whole circle times a over two pi would give us the fraction. And so we'll see the pi's cancel and we get a halves times r squared, but r equals one, so we get a over two. And that is precisely the formula that they had in the paper. So if you look at it, each part of the circle is going to be in one and only one triangle. And so as we go through all of this, it is going to account for all the area of the circles. So the paper might actually be correct. You know, this was the one thing that was really concerning me other than the existence of the triangulation. But when you look at the formula now, I'm actually far more convinced, and we're talking about this at the end of the last class, that this is a reasonable formula. It just, it's not really saying here initially where this is coming from, and when the radius equals one, you lose all sense of units. You know that there has to be something going on, however, because the area should be in meters squared or something like that. And so what's going on over here, if we just have angles, something is wrong. And this is a clue that there's a radius squared floating around. If you do physics, you might occasionally use something called rationalized MKS. Anybody ever hear of rationalized MKS? What do you think the speed of light is in this new system? One. So you choose units so that the speed of light is one. Um, what's the Yes. What is the gravitational constant? One. So there's a limit to how many constants you can choose. At some point, things get forced upon you. As an aside, does anybody know which constant in physics is independent of the units? Fine the fine structure constant, which for a while people thought might be exactly 1 over 137, which is an interesting integer. Turns out it's not exactly 1 over 137. But this is where you look at you know, the ratio, like Fang's constant, the electric charge, and whatnot. So all the units cancel. It's a unitless number that really does embed in it a lot of information about physics. OK. And then in Zoom land, are you now able to see full screen on this? Excellent. And so what I want to do now is starting on Wednesday, there's no class on Monday because of Yom Kippur, is getting into you know, the meat of the content. I want to do a little bit of motivation as to why do we care about packing spheres. I can make some arguments as to why we might care in two or three dimensions. It's a little bit harder to say why we care about packing in 24 or 500 dimensions. Anybody know where I gave this talk? 
or when? Like math fest. Math fest. August. August first. Cincinnati. 2019. The night of the wonder flip. <laughs> so, what was the title of the talk? Yes. And when I submitted the talk, I actually submitted this as the title and I gave an abstract that was similarly. Uh, the abstract. Yes. <laughs> and I was contacted by the AMS, or maybe it was the MA, it was one of them, about um, all the titles in my abstract. And then a few minutes later, there was another email. Oh, wait, I just saw the title of your talk. Ah, that was probably on purpose. So goes, yes, yes, it was. <laughs> Is it hard for you to fix this? No, there's a lot of things that humans can just naturally do without too much trouble. All right, and so what I want to do now is, you know, so here is the, the correct title. Uh, as was remarked before class began, this is an old punch card. I do have some of these in my office, actually one of them. I am so glad we no longer have to program like that. So I want to try to give you a sense of why we care about these sphere practices, about error detection, error correction codes. And there's a lot of things that are extremely simple ideas that have tremendous applications. All right, so just a couple of basics in cryptography. You know, imagine we're using five bits to represent numbers. So we can get all the letters from A to Z and have a little bit extra because we have 32. If you want a little bit more, you could do six bits, but then you're spending more information on most letters. You, know, you don't use that many capitals. I thought you need to really emphasize a point. So maybe you don't have to waste a lot of stuff with capitals, and maybe you just have a special five-digit bit which says whatever follows is a capital, or whatever follows is a special symbol. And if you use those sufficiently, really, it's much better to just have most numbers five bits and not have six bits for everything. So if we can just send zeros and ones, we can send any message. And the goal is to transmit messages so that only the desired recipient can read it, and that they can get the correct message. Related to this is you want to be able to transmit quickly and you want to be able to decode quickly. Those are other uh, interesting challenges. We're going to talk today about the last part, about ensuring that the correct message is received. I, uh, when I was giving this talk, somehow we were talking about Futurama, so I very quickly adjusted my slides on the fly to include this. Has anybody ever seen Futurama? Okay, so it's by the makers of The Simpsons, but with far more math jokes. And they go to incredible lengths. One of my colleagues actually wrote a paper based on the mind body changing episode. Uh, and you know, I might include some stuff about that later. This is an episode where Bender is inheriting a house from a haunted member of his family. And at one point they see these numbers in blood. And they ask Bender, what does this mean? He goes, I have no idea. Later in the episode, he sees the numbers in a mirror and he starts running away in horror. Does anybody know what happens if you read the numbers backwards? What number do you get? You get 666. You get the number of the beast, the number of the devil, written in blood in binary backwards. Very few shows will go to this length to make a math joke. But it was originally read backwards and so wasn't concerned. How many of you have ever seen RSA, which for years was the gold standard of encryption? Okay, so just briefly, you take two primes and the premise of RSA is that it's hard to factor integers. It's easy to check if a factorization is right. And so you take two primes P and Q and you take some number D and you make public the product PQ and you choose a number E such that ED has a remainder of one when you divide by P minus one, Q minus one. And P minus one, Q minus one is the number of numbers less than PQ that are relatively prime to PQ. And it turns out, using some basic algebra, if you take a message M that is less than N, you raise it to the eth power and send out mod N, you get the following. And if you raise that to the dth power and look at it mod N, you get back the original message. It's a really nice, Application of Fermat's little theorem. Uh, some nice basic algebra results. It is very unlikely 
if you choose P and Q to be 200 digit numbers, that your message will have a common factor with that. So there's a couple of things you have to worry about, but in practice, not at all. Imagine you receive one bit off. And again, I'm not doing bits, I'm doing digits just to make it a little bit easier for us to read. And I receive an eight rather than a seven. If we try to decrypt it, there's almost no relation. So a lot of the standard alphabet codes, if you just switch a letter, if you're wrong in one place, you still have most of the message. But here, it's all mixed together and one small mistake means you can't understand what's going on. So this just hopefully shows you how important it is that we make sure that there are no errors. Because even one small error is enough to completely get things off. Now we have two digits right. You know, we have the one in the same spot and the zero. Are you surprised that we have two digits right? Why not? Nine digits. Yeah, it's nine digits. You would expect to have one digit right plus or minus one. So two digits right is not unreasonable. And the number of digits right is so small that it doesn't really help. All right, so we're going to concentrate on error detection and error correction. So error detecting is just being able to determine that a mistake was made. Error correction is actually a little bit better and fixing the mistake that is made. So we're going to talk a lot about majority rules and generalizations. All right, so the first is the check digit approach. If it's easy to read something again, you just need to determine if an error was made. So can anybody give me a situation where all we need to know is that an error was made because it's very easy to read it again? Barcode. Barcode. So if you go to a supermarket and they scan and you know, it was supposed to be you know, $2.99 and it comes up you know, $3,000. You know, it's clear that they didn't scan it right, that they didn't read it right. What happens? You scan it again. And what if it still comes up $3,000? What do you do? I'm sorry? Nope. So you know, the cashier tries again and it's still scanning in paper. You manually enter. So like, ah, screw this, let me just you know, punch it in. And in a situation like that, you just need to detect that the error was done. Most of the time it's gonna be fine, every now and then, beep, okay, let me try, beep, all right, just enter. Any Seinfeld fans here? Do you know the episode, The Opposite? So, one of the characters in Seinfeld is a loser. It is socially acceptable to call him a loser. And he moans one day at lunch that every decision he's made in life is wrong. And so one of his friends tells him, you know, if every decision you make is wrong, the opposite has to be right. What is important for that to be true? Binary decisions. You know, as long as there are only two options, you're fine. So for the rest of the episode, he does the exact opposite of what you would expect people to do. And he just starts getting more and more good things happening to him in life. To the point where, you know, the person he just started dating, um, her dad or uncle works for the New York Yankees and arranges a job interview. And he's being interviewed and he's being asked, how did you lose your previous jobs? Why are you unemployed? And he starts, wow, you are the opposite of every other job candidate I've had. I get that a lot nowadays. And the owner of the Yankees walks by and says, it's a pleasure to meet you. I wish I could say that to you, but most things in life are not binary. Why do we love zero one? Because if it's not zero, it's one. If you're transmitting information, what would be your favorite, what would be your ideal choice for the probability of success? 100%. Right? What is the worst thing for you in transmitting information? The worst percentage of being correct? 50%. Why is 0% not bad? You just know it's the opposite. So if you know you're always wrong, just take the opposite and you're always right. So skin out a supermarket. So here is one simple system. So I'm always going to use pink as the data digits. These are the ones I care about. Blue is always going to be checked in this. And I'm going to do things 
initially in both, both base 10 and base two, eventually we're gonna screw base 10 and just work base two. And what you do is you choose the last digit so that the sum is zero mod 10 or zero mod two. And so in both of these cases, you should check and see, you know, it adds up to, I think 20 in the first one and you know, four in the second. So imagine you receive the following. What can you immediately tell me? There's an error. Where is the error? Uh, second row somewhere because it doesn't add up to a multiple of two. What about the first row? Also an error. Now, if you look at this, it was nine, one, three, four, three, nine, two. So it turns out it's the two here that's wrong, but we have no way of knowing that. For the second one, it should have ended with a one. It's ending with a zero. This time it's the check digit that's wrong. It's annoying in the second case because the message was actually transmitted correctly. So it was the check digit that had the error. But this system will detect certain types of errors. What types of errors will it not detect? Yes. If you have two errors, and if you switch two digits, so if we send instead of nine one, if we send one nine, what's the most common word if you're typing on a keyboard that you would type? Word, the. And I'm curious, what word do you think might be the second most common? It's probably not the second most common, but I think it might be up there. Related to the, same length. I'm sorry? Nope. T-E-H. -E How often do you type E-E-T-E-H? Every day. Every day. And you get, that's something that we can easily correct. Um, it's fascinating when you look at how spell check or autocorrect works on things. Um, at this time, I'll give some stories after this. So, yes. Do you think it's a matrix of like, Right, so we will talk about how to try to isolate where the errors. Right now, we're just detecting. And so if you're a scanner in the supermarket, it's enough to detect. If you're a submarine commander, you need more than just detect. You need to be able to correct. You can't come back up and get the message again. You have to, you can't radio headquarters and say, I didn't get the message. Can you resend that? Here's where your position. Or if you're downloading a very large file, you don't want to have the whole file download and then realize that one of the packets was corrupted and you have to do the whole thing again because it doesn't work. Okay, so there's more involved algorithms. There's the Verhoff algorithm, which is worth looking at, and I'll post the slides, which actually allows you to detect some transposition errors as well. And so depending on how much math you use, you can actually detect a large number of different types of errors. But again, it's not enough for us to really detect where the error is. We want to correct it. So the simplest solution uh, for detecting is to tell me twice. And you make a promise, I will never send anything other than 1, 1 or 0, 0. So if you receive 0, 1, what must be true? Has to be an error. What if you receive 1, 1? Might be an error. The hope is that the probability of an error is sufficiently low that the chance of making two errors is small enough that, okay, I'm almost 100% convinced I meant one more. If your probability of a successful transmission is like 99.9999%, then you get very, very confident. It's not certainty, but you can be extremely confident. So a lot of this is related to majority rules. So the tell me three times detects and probably corrects an error. So we are promised we are only gonna send one, one, one and zero, zero, zero. We will never send anything else. How many possible messages could we have sent with three bits? Eight, how many are we allowing us to send only two? That's all, so only 25% of the possible messages are now available to us. Is this a huge loss? Sometimes, it, well, so one of the things I'm trying to get all of my classes this year to understand is the relativity of size of numbers. It's always in comparison to what? 
and speed of light. <laughs> and so my physics text in, in high school talked about how the results of special relativity seem unreasonable and counterintuitive, but you have to remember most people don't have experience traveling at three quarters of the speed of light. I like the use of the word most. I'm wondering who actually does have experience traveling at three quarters of the speed of light. Uh, in my COVID class today, I was talking about some data about some very energetic cosmic rays, and it had the physical value in the units, and I had absolutely no understanding of, is this strong? But the writer said, to give you some sense, imagine you have a lead shield running from the sun to Pluto, it would travel through that without any issue. Okay, I have some idea now of how energetic this is. 25%. If you're on Williams campus right now and I decreased your net speed by 25%, would you really notice? Wouldn't you decrease by 75%? Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, so basically it would take you four times as long to download most things. Would it really be annoying? No. How, how big are the files are that you're typically looking at? You. If you're getting, you know, 200 megabytes per second or more. That's true, I guess in that case. And then you're going down to 50 megabytes per second, which is equivalent to just making the file, you know, four times larger. You're not gonna really notice it on small files. You know, the download is going to be so fast. You're streaming video, you're not gonna notice. There's a lot of redundancies in CDs when you're playing them because we can read the data so quickly, it doesn't matter. And so when you're trying to put things in context, you're losing, you know, three fourths of the possible messages. Well, if we can transmit messages pretty fast, this might be a reasonable compromise. We obviously want to do better, but it's not terrible. So if we receive these two messages, we know there has to be a mistake. The most likely explanation is that in the first message, it's the zero that's wrong. And in the second message, it's the one that's wrong. It's not a proof. Does anybody have any thoughts as to why we're talking about this in a class on spear packing? So, why do you think we might be talking about this in a class on spear packing? We have to the message 111 all the way up here. The message 000 all the way down here. Yeah, so what messages do you think I might want to put below the 111? 110. What else? 101. And what else? 011. And now down here, which I put over here. Okay, is it 100001? And what should I put over here? And so we, can, we need to decide what metric to use. So this is something we've talked about several times already, that depending on how you choose to measure distances, you'll have different geometries. How should we measure how far apart two points are? Everything should be one apart. So how, how do I want to measure how far 111 is from something? How many bits are different? And so if you look at what's going on over here, um, what we are going to have now is all of the stuff over here 
is going to be really badly done. It's in the circle of radius one in this metric centered at one, one, one. And similarly, all of the stuff over here will be one unit from zero, zero, zero. And so I hope you can begin to see the sphere pattern. That we're choosing certain key bits of data, streams of data to be our center. And we've now partitioned the space into two sets. Everything is within one unit of one of our key code words, or is the key code word itself. And so I'm, I'm hoping this is giving you some sense of why we care about sphere packets. Just because it's such a fun example, and I know one of the slides should excite at least three people in here, two of whom are not myself. I will continue. Okay. So it's crucial that we use this binary outcomes, and these are the clips from the Seinfeld episode that I was mentioning. Some of them may not be appropriate to show in class, but so I will just leave the link for you to watch. Okay, we're I'm sorry? Um, I did not necessarily show the clips. I just mentioned the existence of the clips. So one of the problems with the tell me three times is only one third of our message, or one, only one third of our bits are actually messages. You know, two of our bits are for data detection correction. Can we do better? What about tell me four times? No, really bad idea. Now only one out of every four bits is transmitting information. And if we try to do the general case, tell me n times, it gets even worse. What do you think we should consider a success? What fraction of the message is data? What fraction of the bits is data do you think will be counted as a success? Yeah, if you set the success too high, we're not going to be successful. How likely you want it to be. Right, and so there's going to be trade-offs. But as a rule of thumb, if you want something to be a candidate, what should the success rate be? It should be at least at least a half, or better than a half. It should break 50%. You know, more than half of the digits should actually be conveying information and not just doing these parity chunks. So we'll count greater than 50% will be a success. So I want to be visit tell me three times. I want to really highlight the geometry. The reason I want to do this is when we get to 24 dimensional space, I have no chance in hell of trying anything that is even reasonable geometrically. In small dimensions, I can do that and try to just give you some sense of how to look at things. And I'm going to try to show you different ways of looking at things. So here, you know, these were the same digit as this. So if this was a one, both of these were one. If I go it like this now, if this is a one and this is a one, that means this row sums to zero. And this column sums to zero. So this is another way to view what we're doing. We're putting in two check digits, very similar to what we did with the scanner. And now each row must be zero mod two and each column must be zero mod two. And you can go through and say, well, if this was a, supposed to be one, 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 and I had one, zero, one, I know this column is probably right, and I know this row is probably wrong. Since this column is right, this is probably right, this has to be the error right here. Similarly, if I have 0, 1, 1, then I have an error in the first column, I have an error in the first row, and then this gets back to your question, can we localize where the error is? Yes, there's one unique point that intersects. There are people who are using math like this for COVID testing. Imagine you have, you know, n squared people. You form an n by n grid and you test everybody in row n that costs n tests. And you basically take their body material and you just put it together. And you test everybody in each of the n columns and that's another n test. 
if only one person is infected, then two tests come back positive, and you know a column and you know a row, and you can uniquely determine the individual. If there's more than one person infected, you might get more people as candidates, and maybe they don't all have it, but now you have a much smaller pool of people. And a lot of countries adopted strategies like this to cheaply test. When most people are testing negative, it's very expensive. Uh, anybody know a situation where people are willing to spend the money and test everybody individually? Yeah, Williams College, right? This is what we're doing. I did my weekly COVID test you know, a few moments ago. Um, I will know sometime in the next 24 to 48 hours if it was safe for me to come and teach you guys today. I'll try to update you on that. All right. So what if we try to do two bits of data? I could arrange it like this. And I have my two pink data digits, and I have three check digits. And you can go through the calculation, and you can see if this pink digit here is wrong, I'm going to get an error in the row, and I'm going to get an error in the column. And I've got 50%. Nope. 40%. Better than third, if I did more columns, could I get it as close to 50% as I want? The problem is the length then grows. And so to get it close to 50%, I'm doing it at the cost of having an incredibly long string of data and check digits. And the more of these I have, the more likely it is that I now have two errors. So while this will move us closer to 50%, it will do so in a bad way. So the question is, what should we try next? Squares. Any other shapes? We'll get to triangles. We've already had this battle in this class, the square versus the triangle. Right? Who won in the plane? Triangle. Any, uh, there might be giant fans here who can play triangle man later. Okay? So here's two different ways of doing the first is a triangle, and I'll extend the size to get my check digits, and the second is a square. In terms of drawing, I'm much happier to draw the square. I can easily see how the square generalizes. Which is better, the triangle or the square? They both have the same ratio. ratio. They both have 50% is data. So we just barely missed the greater than 50%. We're damn close there. Which is better though, the triangle or the square? Why the triangle? Because you expand it out and you wouldn't need to add any more. Okay. What do you mean by expand it out? If you put a point in between each of these squares. Okay, well, we could also expand the square, but I'm saying right now, which is better, the six points for the triangle or the eight points for the square? And I claim one is significantly better than the other. What's the advantage of the triangle over the square? Fewer points. And so the more points you have, the more likely you ought to have two errors. So the triangle gets the same efficiency with fewer points. So we could try to do five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it's interesting, some numbers are actually going to work better than others in terms of the geometry. So here's one way to try to extend. So the square, it's really easy to extend. I don't have to worry about coding. I just look at row and column. For the triangles, I extended to a nice triangle like this. Here are my lines. And then I put one new point over here, and I have it as a check digit for those three. And if you notice now, every data point is on exactly two lines. Every check digit is on exactly one line. The point that's floating is on one line. Both give 60%, but the triangle does it with fewer. There's a better way of doing the triangle. And what we do is we took the points that were check digits before and we make them data, and then we extend those lines, and then we draw a new line that goes through what was the check digit. And then you can keep going like this. So I don't know anybody who's actually really pushed stuff like this farther. There's better ways than doing this. But what I like is I've actually given this talk all the way down to elementary school where you can really talk to the kids about the geometries. It's much easier to work with the square, but you can't keep extending the triangle. And you can look and see how efficient is it going to be. You know, we have a nice formula for the triangle numbers. 
Uh, the nth one is just n n plus one over two, and you can see that uh, the total bits that become information is n over n plus two. And the square gives you the same thing; it just takes more points to do it. So you can get as high of a percentage as you want, but at the cost of using more and more digits, so it becomes more and more likely to have multiple errors. So is there a better geometry to use? You've already said the answer. Higher dimensions. So we can use cubes. So if we do a two by two cube, that's going to be eight data points. Three by three by three would be 27. And what I can do now is I can do my check digits. You know, I'll do my check digits will be essentially, you know, one color for each plane. So I have the orange, the blue, the white, the yellow, the red, the green. If this piece is wrong, then there'll be three check digits that come out wrong. The blue, the orange, and the white. And then that means it has to be this one over here. And you can keep going through and saying, you know, what would happen in all the different cases. Over here, we'll have all the planes coming through. Right, so if you want it over here, you could actually view this as your check digit. Is it possible to just have the orange and the white check digits wrong? On the two by two by two, no. On the three by three by three, yes, if this one over here is wrong, only the orange and the white would turn out to be wrong. And on the two by two by two, we actually get 57% with 14 points. The three by three by three, we get 75%. For six by six square, it's also 75%. Um, but for the triangle, uh, T7 gives you 77.78% with you know, 28 over 36 instead of 27 out of 36. So the triangle is just really beating it, but not going to be beating it for much longer. Uh, if you go a little bit higher, you can start comparing you know, with a four by four by four, we're getting about 84% with 76 bits. The nine by nine square is 81% with 99. The uh, triangle is 83% and that's with 79. So you're getting a lower percent of data with more points. So already the four by four by four is enough to do better. Any other shapes we could use? The dodecahedron. And so, you know, the fraction is n squared over n squared plus three. We use the dodecahedron, we could use the tetrahedron. And you could start asking, well, what's going on over here? And which points are going to be your checkpoints in that? And then how do you expand out the dodecahedron to higher uh, numbers where you now have more than just you know, one piece in the middle on the side over here? But you can calculate what your efficiencies would be for all of these. What I want to do for the last couple of minutes is turn to Hammond probes now. And so it is possible to send a message with seven bits where four bits are data. And it will allow you to correct one error. So a lot of the stuff in the subject is called Hamming. He was an extremely influential researcher, I believe at Bell Labs. And the story is that he was low man on the totem pole. And so his punch cards were saved for the weekend to run. And he would come back on Monday and see that it ran 16 lines before it found a mistake. And then a couple of days later, it gets to run again and does another maybe 22 lines before it gets to a mistake. And with the language cleaned up, it was, gee, I wonder why the computer is so good at detecting an error has been made and not so good at correcting. Maybe there could be some way to help the computer. And this led him to think about how could we not just detect, but also correct errors. What's the most efficient way to do this? And so in homage to Manhattan, I will call this Manhattan. We have a city with seven nodes, and we have three different bus routes or subway lines. So blue route, the orange route, and the green route. So the blue, orange, and green are going to be my check digits. Anybody have any idea why I've given them these names? I always ask, why are you naming them as they are? And that's what D1, D2, D3, D4 stand for. Data 1, data 2, data 3, data 4. 
P1, P2, P3 will be priority one, priority two, priority three. Why is it labeled three, five, six, seven, and one, two, four? Yeah, these are the powers of two. I'm using the powers of two as my priority points. So if I, what do you think would be the next natural place to go up to? This is going up to seven points. 15. And that things are going to be nice up to powers of two. And so what you could do is you can go through and just check if there are no errors, everything is correct, that's great. If everything is wrong, uh, it's gonna be D4. So why is that the case? Well, if all of, if the blue is wrong and the orange is wrong and the green is wrong, only one point hits all of them. And then you can go, if there's only one color error, if it's just blue, um, if only the blue one is wrong, what point has to be? has to be P1. Because every point up here is on at least two lines. If blue and orange are wrong, there's only one point that's on both blue and orange. Um, I point to the, I'm oh, sorry, and that's the point over here, D1. So you can go through this calculation and it will show you that it will allow you to uniquely determine. I am deliberately not telling you why I chose to, correct, to connect the points I'm choosing. I will leave this, you don't have to write this up, but I will leave this as a puzzle for you to think, why am I choosing to connect P1 to three, to five, and seven, but not to six? It works, but why was that choice made? So I will let you think about that as to why is this the case? And I wanna to try to do this as much as possible is not to give you all the answers, but to try to give you some interesting questions to think about. And then if you had to push it further, what would you do as you add that new point? You know, imagine you wanted to transmit around 4,000 bits of data. We can look at the corresponding Hamming code, the square, the cube, not even bothering with the triangle. They all are phenomenal. Okay, yeah, the square is only around 97%. The Hamming code is around 99.7%. 99.7% is better. But at this point, so much of your message is data that it's not a huge hit anymore. We're not talking on the order of 2%. And so sometimes the simpler method is actually better to do because the efficiency is already so good that we don't really need to do anything better. How many of you have a phenomenal ear for music? Or how many of you, if you just hear anything on the standard CD player, you're not gonna hear the difference between that and the deluxe super mastery. I would put myself in that category. And so you want to ask sometimes, you know, is it really needed? Now here's one of the really great ideas in the subject. It's called interleaving. So imagine we have a string of zeros and ones that we want to transmit, and there's a burst of noise, a localized burst of noise, say a solar flare. The problem is we assume that errors are independent, and that you know, it's unlikely to have you know, two errors in quick succession. And so it will transmit, say, in blocks of four. But now, if there is this burst, you're now more likely to have multiple errors in a block. And so the assumption that the errors are independent is violated. Any thoughts on how you can get around this? Sorry? I, I, what about block? Right, but, but the blocks, but the blocks you know, if we just break it up into normal blocks, they're still going to be connected. The solution is transmit every four or every hundred. What this means now is you need to have the entire message before you can start transmitting. But now, two bits that were next to each other are now separated by four or a hundred or a thousand. And so if there is a localized burst, it's not going to affect two digits in the same block now. So this is a really simple idea, and I love elegant ideas that have huge consequences. 
It does mean you need to know the entire message before you transmit it. So if you're in the middle of writing something and you're just doing it as you go, can't do that now. All right, we have about four minutes left. And I thought I would just use this as a fun application of steganography, hiding messages and messages. Can anybody see the cat in the tree? <laughs> All right. Um, can you see the tree now? Oh, yes. Okay, there you go. So I will give an A plus to anybody who can see the cat right now. Okay. It's hidden in the pixels. So imagine we want to transmit an image. So we have a grid L by W. Each pixel is going to be a triple, red, green, blue. We love base two. Uh, we like to do 256. We take N equals eight. So when you look at this tuple, there's a little bit under 17 million possible colors we can transmit. How many colors do you think you can really distinguish? Six. six? <laughs> I hope you can do a little bit better than six. Maybe a few thousand. Do you think you, think you like can do as many thousand. as a few thousand? Yeah. I think a hundred is probably, I mean, if you think about a Crayola pack, you know, the 64, <laughs> the 128, you know, I think I can pretty much distinguish all of those and the difference between jungle green and, you know, rainforest green, I think, maybe not, but I think on the order of a hundred I can do, a thousand probably, 10,000, 100,000, you know, 100, I don't think I can see 100,000 distinct colors. So, psychonography is the art of concealing a message in another message. Imagine, you know, we just want to send a black and white text. So, just characters on a white sheet. Each pixel is going to be zero, one, white or black, on, off. So, take one of the colors, say red, and it's going to be number from zero to 255. So, you write it in binary. And if you change just the last or the last two digits, that gives you either two or four possible colors for red. So we change just the last, we can encode zero for white and one for black. And then when we get the message, we just read off the last digit of red into a separate file. And that will give us a text message. And it's not going to change the color that much. It's going to change the color by at most one out of 255. If you change it by even up to three out of 255, it's not going to be a big deal. And of course, a lot of the time, your color might actually be the same as what it was over there, is that it was already a one, and you want to make it a one half. So you might not even see any change in the image. If we do two, we could have four for red, four for the other two each, it would give us 64 colors. So just by changing the last two digits, and on average, you're not going to be changing that much. We now have 64 colors at our disposal. So where's the cat? The cat is in the entire image. And this is used to hide images, to hide messages. So I've actually done some work on Benford's law, on biases and digits. And you can apply similar arguments to show that there are tests to tell if an image has been modified. And this is extremely important on the 21st century when people are providing you know, evidence. You know, can you tell, was this photo really taken when it was allegedly taken? Or has something been added? Um, I, I mentioned Deep Space Nine, uh, Star Trek in my first class. I'll mention Star Trek in this class. A very popular episode in the original series from the 1960s was The Trouble with Triples. And to celebrate, I think it was like 30 years of Star Trek or something like that, uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, which was on the year, decided to pay homage to this episode with the episode, I think, Trials and Tribulations, where the crew goes back in time and they spliced the current actors onto the scenes from the original show from the 60s. And sometimes what they did is they would use the body of somebody from the crew back then and they would just change the head or they would add an extra person at the end of the line, or they would just put them walking in the hallway. But they made it look like they were together. And so as the technology gets better and better and better, how much can you trust what you're being shown 
can you trust that this is being done? So this is to prepare us for looking at sphere packing as to why do we hear so much about things such as sphere packing. It's going to be related to, among other things, error detection and error correction. And it is going to be absolutely essential to be able to tell uh, if something has been modified, if something is right. All right, so I am going to stop the recording.